Okay, here we go. This is the Gospel of Mark. Um, okay, this is the shortest of the Gospels, and this will probably take us about, it won't take us long to go through this. Um, uh, John Mark was the uh, cousin of Barnabas, um, nephew, nephew, cousin, and uh, he was a son of one of the leading women in the church of uh, Jerusalem. So uh, early, he be, you know, he went on a couple of missionary adventures with Paul. That's described in Acts. But uh, he got homesick and left, and Paul didn't really have a lot of use for that. We get like a real, you know, Paul and Barnabas came to like a real disagreement about it, a dispute in Acts 15. Yeah, but later on, at the, towards the end of his life, you know, Paul says that, um, you know, Mark was useful, you know, reconciled to him. And Mark, uh, you know, uh, what happened, it seems, is that after this little homesick thing, he goes home and then, you know, Peter, I mean, Paul doesn't want him to be a part of any more missionary adventures. Uh, Mark uh, hooks up with Peter. And Peter knows all about second chances because Jesus gave him a couple, you know. And uh, even after Jesus was gone, we know that Paul talks about in Galatians about Peter doing something and having to be uh, withstood to the face. So Peter understood, like, you know, bouncing back. You know, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he fall, though he fall, he shall not be cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. That's from the Psalms. So uh, John Mark... Uh, you know, who wrote this gospel, really hung around with Peter. And this is really Peter's telling of the story of Jesus as John Mark remembered it. So it may have been written after Peter was, uh, was executed. Peter was uh, crucified. Legend says it, that he was crucified upside down. Um, you, know, that, you know, whether that's true or not, he was crucified at, at one point because he was, he was uh, not a Roman citizen, so he was crucified. Paul was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. So in the same general time frame, Paul and Peter both were executed by Emperor Nero. Um, so, but, you know, as, as Peter was getting ready to leave his, this life, he made sure that Mark wrote this account of Jesus's, uh, Jesus's ministry down. And, the, and the, you know, so uh, the audience really is for Roman Christians. And so this makes sense. Uh, you know, it's the servant theme uh, Peter, we think of Peter primarily as maybe someone who dealt with the Jewish people, but you know, uh, Peter was the first of the disciples who actually watched a Gentile group of people receive Christ in the story of Cornelius in the book of Acts. So uh, Cornelius was a, a Roman soldier and uh, you know, very kind to the people and uh, had a vision from God and, you know, men were sent to bring Paul. Paul came and preached. So Peter, you know, really had a, uh, you know, Peter came and preached to, uh, to uh, Cornelius and there was this, um, um, there was this, uh, the Holy Spirit fell on these people and they believed God as Peter was preaching to them. So there's this idea of the servant theme. This presents Jesus serving, you know, throughout this. Um, and, and it's interesting because he also, as uh, Mark is very careful to, the audience is, is not necessarily Hebrew because the Hebrew culture, the Hebrew customs, the Jewish customs are, are presented. So you don't have so many Old Testament references. There's only 63, less than, you know, less than half of what Matthew had. And Luke even had close to 100. So... Um, this is really just for the Roman, the Roman kind of community, uh, slaves and that, you know, that kind of thing. So he, wanted to, he wants to reveal Christ as the servant of God, all right? You know, so that's the thing. That this, this gospel shows Christ in constant action. He's healing, doing miracles, constant action. And uh, there's only four parables in here. And so Mark, uh, Mark is more about the, uh, you know, is the, uh, the highlights, you know, and uh, Matthew's the explanation. Kind of interesting. And that's the way I like to look at it. Matthew gives you a lot of explanation, a lot of talking, 
a lot of things, the discourses about Jesus, but uh, in Mark, you just get like Jesus in activity. It makes sense that this would be the way Peter remembered things. You know, Peter remembered, you know, Peter was the man of action, you know, chopping off the guy's ear, you know, that kind of thing in the garden. So, um, so there's 18 miracles and only one long talk, major discourse. So you, um, so like I said, Matthew likes to emphasize what Jesus said. Mark likes to focus on what Jesus did. And so it's just a little way. This is different. We're getting a better picture of who Jesus is. And, um, and it gives sort of an explanation to the Romans as to why the Jews rejected the Jewish king and priests. So it, like the Romans are probably, if this guy is so great and this is the fulfillment of everything, then why did the Jewish people not get it? You know, and so. All right, key verses. Uh, Mark 1, 14 and 15. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. And then in 1045, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. So I like you see these active verbs. Jesus came, Jesus preached, Jesus said. So, you know, throughout this gospel, that's the way things happen here. All right. Immediately, this is the one thing, 40 times in your old in your old King James, it may say straightway, as like right away, you know, Jesus is going to immediately, immediately. It's like the stories are that little, um, what an adverb, immediately Jesus did this, immediately he did this, it's like no waiting. It's like, God, you know, obviously, didn't they walk like a half a mile to the next place? And not, not in, not in, um, not in Peter's mind as he's dictating to Mark or something like that. Um, but this is, this is interesting. So this is like, the, it's, it's uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Like that's like, it's a, in the first gospel, he sets up the point. He said, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. Jesus Christ is of the King. He's also of the father of our faith. So that's an establishment in that gospel. In this gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, just very clear. Jesus, referring to the nature of his humanity, Christ, the title of his servanthood, the anointed one, and then the Son of God, the designation of his nature as being the one from heaven. So these opening words are pretty clear. The opening words of Matthew's gospel establish something, and this is like the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Son of God. It's like a, Peter is just saying, I'm talking about Jesus. Mark is writing these things down. Mark is uh, writing these things down about the good news, you know, uh, about who Jesus is. Uh, all right. You okay? Good. Move on. All right, the gospel, the word gospel is used most here, this idea of good. This is not like a, this is not a evangelical word. This is not a religious word. You'll find like Roman writings in Latin that talk about this, use this word. The good news about the triumph of the legion in Gaul. You know, so the idea of good news, the idea of a gospel wasn't necessarily uh, related just to the person of Christ and the mission of the church. The Romans used this word. We've got good news. Our legion of soldiers won this battle. We're going to have a celebration the next day to celebrate the good news. So the Romans sent out gospels too. We got good news. And this is, but this is the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so it announces three things. <clears throat> uh, it announces the perfect servant of God, which is important because perfect humanity has to offer itself and take the place of the traitors, us, the imperfect humanity. So the perfect servant of God, his perfected service. So he was perfect and he served perfectly. And then the last thing is like his salvation perfects us. Okay? So there's three elements there. Yes, Jesus came perfect. Jesus lived as a man those years, thought as a man, saw everything that men saw, 
you know, was really engaged in everything that men had to deal with, but he lived perfectly. His service was perfected by the decisions he made every day of his life, and that sacrifice was offered for us, and now he perfects us by giving us his righteousness. He can give it to us. So just as satisfied in the perfect person giving himself for the imperfect. He absorbed, he absorbed. Mercy is absorbing the punishment meant to be paid on those uh, who sinned. You know, he gets in the way of it. It's like, and that's a big thing because people say, where's the justice in it? The justice is in the fact that Jesus threw himself in front of the train that was coming to run us over. The judgment, the train was coming to run us down and rightly so because it says that we deserve death. The wage of sin is death and Jesus just absorbed it all. And that's, the, you know, that's what mercy is. Mercy recognizes the punishment that was paid and then absorbs the punishment. That's what Jesus did and that's why his salvation is perfecting. He robes us with his righteousness. We don't have our own righteousnesses anymore. We put on his righteousness. Okay, uh, repeat and re repent and believe in the gospel. This is uh, Mark ten forty five. It's um, and we just look at this closely. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's not Mark ten forty five. I've got that wrong. Where is that? No, that's for the Son of Man came. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, we'll find where that is. Okay, it's the preposition here. Repent and believe in the gospel. I think that was the early verse. Where is it? Where are we at? Okay, should have been Mark. Yeah. Repent ye and believe in the gospel. So that should be Mark 1.15, not Mark 10.45. Mark 1.15. Sorry about that. Uh, repent and believe in the gospel. That's the Greek preposition. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the sphere the gospel is the sphere of rest. You put your confidence in the gospel, you put your trust in it, and you rest. Okay? The gospel is the sphere of rest. A sphere is the influence or the control. So when you repent and believe in the gospel, you have entered into a sphere of rest. The preposition is there. So the gospel is the sphere of rest. If you want to get into that, that place, if you want to get into that place of rest in God, you repent. You change your mind. You recognize that you need the rest that Christ has for you. You need the perfection that only he can give. All right, so Mark, um, Mark 1 starts very fast, very furious. There's miracle after miracle throughout this. The demons start to testify about him. So, you know, the begins, he just launches right into healing people, touching people, unclean spirit being delivered. Um, and uh, they cry out, the cry, they cry, the demons testify, you are the son of God. And all the city hears the message that happens in verse 33. It says, you know, uh, the whole city was gathered together at the door when they saw those. And all those who were sick were coming to him. People were coming from every quarter of the region to get a touch, to get healed by Jesus Christ. And so that's the... You know, if you're going to get people, if, you know, the Romans are interested. The Roman mind was interested in like, what's the activity of this guy? What's his authority? Show me. And Mark does this. Okay. Oh, you want to know? You know, you want to know what Jesus is about? This is what he's about. Demon possessed guys. The demons recognized who he was. And then all the city responded right away. And people just started coming because they recognized that they could be made well by the person of Christ. <clears throat> Now, this is a great passage um, in Mark 4, 13. This is like really, like if you want a little bit of, this is like one of the only sort of teaching passages here. And this is like the progression of entanglement. And uh, he's talking about the parable of the sower and how, you know, some things, some, some seed falls on bad soil, good soil. Now, and, some, and the, he makes this, um, he stops in this point, He's talking about uh, verse 18. There are seeds that are sown among thorns, and these are the ones who hear the word. And then here's the entanglement, this progression. And this is like, this is very instructive for you and for me. 
Like, what is the first process? The cares of this world. That's the first thing. Like, how does, you know, God has sown something in my life, something powerful. He's given me like a calling on my life. And what could take me out? The cares of this world. Oh, I need, like, I need a new car. So that means I need a new job. That means I got to stop going to Bible college because I need a new job because I got the cares of this world. And so, you know, you could go down that way. Like, okay, go back to the first thing. What were you called to do? Why are you here? All right? Okay, I came because God called me to be here and, you know, God gave me a vision for my life. Okay, the cares of the world are going to come. I'm just saying, you just, you know, Jesus is saying this happens. Like, you know, sometimes things get sown in your life and like those little thorny things start to come up and it gets, it gets worse. Like you could give this up. Once you give that up because you, you have this need, then there's this deceitfulness. Wow, this is like so amazing. So amazing. I got like a little bit of money in my pocket. Man, I, you know, I don't, you know, I can eat like at high class hamburger joints, you know. Forget McDonald's and the dollar menu. I'm all the way up at Red Brick Station now. And, you know, Red Robin, I'm getting like one of them like really amazing burgers with mushrooms and A1 sauce and little curly um, uh, onion rings, all that kind of stuff. Oh, man, I'm hungry now. Yeah, yeah, it's like that, you know. And so it's that you're deceived. You know, you get a little bit of money and you're deceived. Like this is, I must be blessed. I'm blessed. It's the deceitfulness of riches, and then the lust or the desire for other things choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. The word is there. didn't leave you. It's just that the other things that have, you've gotten yourself so, that I get myself so entangled in have choked out its effectiveness. This is the, so it really could start with something very simple, like, you know, well, well, I guess I need that. It's like, and then before you know it, I have to have Lexus. You know, the kind that parks itself, because I'm tired of, like, parallel parking. I want the new Lexus that parks itself. That's what I want. You know, I just push a button, and it goes back into, look, hands off, you know. But that's the, that's the progression. It can be, like, first it can be something that's see. Well, who could argue with the care that you need to take, you know, take care of? And then, but you can get deceived, and then the next thing you know, that deception leads into a lust for other things. It's no longer just enough to have, like, you know, this. you got to have this, and it's a progression of entanglement. The word is choked, and it's unfruitful, you know. All right, next thing. Um, this is the great thing. Uh, Mark 5 talks about the story of the demoniac, and this is the making of a missionary. Like, all right. You didn't know that the best way to make a missionary is to start out being full of a legion of demons. You know, that the most effective missionaries seem to be the people who have legions of demons in them. And then Jesus comes and the demons rush out into the pigs. They go crashing into the water. And this guy comes to Jesus and says, I want to go with you. And it's kind of interesting. Jesus says, no, it's not your place to come with me. Go home and tell people about what I did for you. And he listened. That's like the amazing thing. It's like he came to the boat and he's just like begging, I want to be one of your people. Come on, let, let me come with you. And Jesus just looked at him and loved him and just said, it's not your place. And the thing is, is that he went to all the cities and he talked about that. And then we get back to, you read Mark 5, you can read Mark 5 and you can see how he delivered the demoniac and the whole exchange. But the, the big thing is... Um, uh, Matt, Mark, two chapters later, Mark 7, 31, Jesus leaves the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he came through Decapolis, the same place where the Legion guy was. Legion man has so promoted the gospel, everyone, they, and then when they found out he was back, you know, the story was when Legion man was delivered, the people said, get out of here. We don't want you to be here with us. And then Legion Man says, yeah, I don't want to be with these people either. I want to come with you. And he sent him back. So the Legion Man told his story. And then when Jesus came back, look at the response. They uh, brought to him uh, one who was deaf and an impediment in his speech. And he begged him to put his hand on it. And Jesus healed the deaf and opened his ears. And then before you know it, all manner of people 
were coming to bring the sick to him. And even at the, the, the height of it, in another gospel, Jesus raised someone from the dead. So Jesus returned to this place. The man was delivered. He listened to Jesus, did what Jesus told him to do. When Jesus came back, everyone was ready to receive the message. They weren't ready when it first happened, but when the demon guy got to tell his story, people were ready. Uh, let's see. All right. Uh, different. Go through these here. Uh, Mark 8, he heals the blind man in two stages. This is like there's different, you know, Jesus, like uh, we heard the story in, in um, the message last night, that little story that Pastor Schaller was telling about, like, uh, you know, um, Jesus gave all the disciples a stone. This isn't like a scriptural story, but it's, a, it's telling, and the stone turned into bread. And then he, Jesus said, pick up stones, and, you know, the next time they just threw them into the water, that kind of thing. Like Jesus didn't heal people the same way all the time. Sometimes he spat and made mud and put it on their eyes. This time he touched the guy's eyes. It didn't happen right away. He said, I see men as trees. Jesus touched his eyes again. Then he saw clearly. And then this in Mark 10, 17 to 31, this is the story of the rich young ruler, but there's a significant part of this story that's only in this gospel. And it's just a little word, but it's an important word. Um, uh, let me find it, sorry. Um, verse 21, the whole story, you know the story of the rich young ruler. I've done all these things. Um, I've kept all these things up to my youth. I've kept all the commandments and everything. And Jesus looking at him, and then here's the two words, loved him. Jesus looking at him, loved him. We don't get that, those two words in another gospel, but we get those two words here. In this gospel, it says Jesus looking at him, loved him. And for that reason, people think that the rich young ruler was Mark, that Mark put this word, these two words in there to say that Jesus loved me so much to tell me just what I needed to do. You know, that's just, you know, conjecture. You know, we can't prove it, but it might, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's great that the Gospels are a little bit different and you get these little pieces. But here it says he loved him and told him to go and sell what you have and give to the poor. And the man went away sorrowful. Jesus loved him enough to tell him how to break his bondage to his possessions. Um, in Mark 12, 28, there's this, they're trying to trick him. And they're asking, what is the greatest commandments? And Jesus does and Jesus goes and says to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. With that, if you get these two things right, everything else is possible. Everything else is right. If you're loving the Lord with all that and you recognize this one was made in his image just like you were, then you're going to love him just like you love yourself because you know what you're feeling and you want him to feel the same thing. And Jesus reduced the whole life of walking with God to these two sentences. You know, it's like, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. It's very simple. If those things are in order, there's not a whole lot of, there's not a whole lot of killing, stealing, and coveting going on. Because you're in line with him, and you love that one that you don't want his wife, you don't want his house, you don't want his car, you don't want his iPad. It's mine. Sorry, okay. All right. I don't want you to have my iPad either. Okay. <laughs> don't ask me for it. Uh, anyway, but Jesus answers silence is those because, they, you know, they had built up this stack of commandments. Like, what do we have to do to do the works of God? Jesus said, believe. That's going to happen in John. He's going to say that in John. It's like, you don't have to, this whole group of stuff that you're thinking is really going to make you acceptable to God. It's all, it's all nothing. This is the thing. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That means everything else will take care of itself. All right. Now, these passages are important. Um, this garden, this like, this, you know, Peter was right there. And so we have this really tortured kind of moment in the garden where Jesus prays and he finds his disciples sleeping. And then when he comes back a couple of times, he says, sleep on. And then he has to say, it's time to go. This is, a, this is like a really important moment. It's like Jesus 
has these men that have been with him for three years, but this is a path that no one else can walk. This is going to be the moment of darkness. This is going to be the moment of, of, of defeat in one way. He's going to lay his life down, and no one can walk this with him. And he walks out of that garden, and he walks through all that he had to walk through in the trials and the scourging and the cross and all that, uh, but only he could do that. And like that whole atmosphere was starting to take all of his support system away. Again, don't think of it as any, you know, the fact that Jesus perfected his uh, purpose by walking through this moment without a lot of help. You know, nobody around him is hanging with him. It's like this, think of the miracle that is. You know, think of the miracle that he's carrying, he's walking a dark road. No one is going to pitch himself into this, you know, with him. No one's going to be with him in this. Only he is going to commit him, his spirit to the Father and, and walk into death, you know. And, you know, it's easy for, well, he was God. Of course he knew, but he was a man, totally a man. And like he had to believe the word that he had with the Holy Spirit inspired to be written and live by. You know, don't think of it as any less miraculous. It's like this is so amazing that anybody would like be able to walk this kind of road and say, I'm going to jump into death and believe the word that was written. Everyone's saying, did Jesus really act in faith? Absolutely. Listen to what he says on the cross. Into your hands I commit my spirit, Father into your hands I commit my spirit. There's a commission there. It's like Jesus isn't saying like, I know that we're going to do this together, Dad. It's like, it's going to be awesome. We're just going to ride like, a, you know, we're going to windsurf into hell and right back out. It's like, no, it's like, it is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And like, you, Jesus is launching, uh, Jesus is launching himself into a place no one had ever been before. No, you know, he's launching into death, and he's going to come out of it, of course, because of his perfect life. It was a validation, but, you know, that's, that's it. And then this last part of Mark, it talks about his commissioning here. And some of the manuscripts do not have that. I'm just telling you that. That's, you'll read that some places, that 9 to 20. You know, it, it's not there. Uh, but, I mean, he, this is a commission. He says, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every great creature, and he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And so you have some things that are said there, but that's not in all the manuscripts. So there is this, you know, somehow this, you know, either got added or it was, you know, wasn't, you know, however they copied those things back then, some of these things. So, all right, last part here. What do we need to know? All right. So Mark does reveal to us the nature of Christ's service, the law of his service, and the result of his service. So we know that you know, the nature of Christ's service was redemption. The law of his service was to live by every word of God, and the result of his service was our salvation. So we need to see that in there. Uh, what do we need to know? The Son of God did become the servant of God in order to create the good news, the gospel. If there, this doesn't happen. There is no gospel, right? We don't, we don't have a lot to tell people if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. Next. The law of the life of the church is its abiding confidence in the servant of God. So, right, what's the, you know, so that's the life of the church is only as uh, powerful and as life-changing as its confidence in Jesus Christ, the servant. So if you're looking for the way a church should operate, this is it. You know, you look in this gospel. And the law of the service of the church is its abiding confidence in the gospel. Do you have confidence in the gospel to do what it says? You know, we do a lot of things to try and make people come to church, you know, but really uh, the most powerful tool that we have is the Word of God, is the gospel. So, you know, we, you know, our law of service should be confidence in what Jesus said, what he did. Okay, what do we need to do? Believe in the gospel, rest in it for our life, for pardon, and for our power, and rest in it for the service. So take the gospel and just let it be your um, you know, your uh, guide there. Rest in it. We have to believe in it. And then why do we need to do this? Okay, if we lose our confidence in the gospel, 
then our service becomes weak. Like we can invent a lot of things, but if the gospel is not in it, then there's not really a lot of authority to it. If we doubt the gospel of the servant of God, then we have no gospel for the man who is bound in sin and nature's night. That's a quote from um, Charles Spurgeon. If we doubt the gospel of the servant of God, we have no gospel for the man who is fast bound in sin and in nature's night. So, I mean, it really is like, what is your confidence? What is my confidence in what Jesus has done for me in the good news? Do I have that confidence? Is it something that I recognize as powerful? If I don't have that confidence, then my chances of convincing someone about uh, coming to Christ and being free from sin and the darkness that he's in is, you know, is possible, is uh, impossible. So that's why we need to do this. And here's the last thing. The tomb is empty. That's the great message that we have. That's the real gospel. There's no one in there. There's no one in there. He came out. He's up there living above, making intercession for us. And that's a great thing to think about. Have confidence in that. See that in your mind every day. And I think you'll be okay in serving God. Okay? All right. Lord, we thank you for the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, for all that they say about who you are and all that they tell us about your purpose and ministry. We ask you to help us to sleep well, to have a great week, and to really just uh, recognize uh, your activity in all that we do and all that you're doing in this world. Thank you for the gospel. Help us to really recognize it as the only power to change people's lives. In your name, amen. All right. See ya. Goodbye now. Put in the next DVD. All right. Just watch them all right in a row. It just to just have a Bible survey marathon. It'll be great. Ha, ha, ha.